Once again today, we greet you in the lovely name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you here in the house of the Lord in the Northside Baptist Church. May the Lord bless you and warm your hearts during this hour coming up. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, I most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Now if you have the original Scofield Reference Bible, you find my text on page 1110. I prefer the original Scofield Reference Bible, the King James Version. God has used it to save nations, save multitudes, produce revivals. That is the King James Version. I'm partial toward the Scofield Reference Bible, the footnotes and so forth. That doesn't mean I agree 100% with Dr. Scofield's reference, but most of them I do, maybe a few that we see differently. That doesn't mean that I know more than he, but always maybe you find in some reference Bibles or books where people have footnotes and their own comments and what they believe might be a little different from what you really believe. Dr. Schofield was a great man of God. I think he was a drunkard, save when he was about 40 years old, became a great Bible scholar. I have some of the Schofield reference Bibles, King James Version. I have a few on the table over here you see on your left. I have some in my study. I bought up a few during the year that I might save you anywhere from 10 to $15 on these Bibles. I'm not in the Bible selling business, but if I can get one at a bargain where I can save you uh, 10 or $15, I do so. And I do have about a dozen Bibles on hand. I have the burgundy, have the black, and maybe about one blue. But anyway, they are beautiful Schofield reference Bibles, King James Version. I wouldn't use any other kind of version other than the King James for my preaching and teaching. Now these modern translations like uh, the Revised Standard Version, the uh, the uh, Good News for Modern Man, and, and uh, translations like that, uh, they're not good. They're translated by liberals, infidels, and modernists. And so you need to stick by the old King James Version. Stick by that. Don't fool with these modern liberal translations. You're wasting your time. Throw them in the trash can. They're not fit to spend your money on. I wouldn't support a preacher if he got up in the pulpit and started reading out of one of these modern translations. I wouldn't support him. I wouldn't listen to him. I wouldn't, he wouldn't be my pastor. I'll be honest with you. I believe the King James Version is the best translation we have today, translated by some uh, 40 or maybe more Bible scholars, Greek scholars, Hebrew scholars, many years ago. And God has honored that translation. It's of God, I believe that with all of my heart. In these last days, you have these infidels and liberals and modernists on the scene whenever the denominational the seminaries are filled with liberals and infidels do not believe in the infallibility of the Word of God filling the pulpits. Naturally, they go for these modern translations because they don't believe anything themselves. But you stick with the old book of God, the King James Version. Have nothing to do with these others. Don't waste your money on them. Don't buy them. And don't support a man that uh, spends his time trying to say a little sermonette from some of them. I just wouldn't do it. Now you turn to Luke 23. I'm going to speak to you today on a man that was saved just a matter of maybe minutes before he died, before he went on into eternity. He was saved just a few moments before he went into paradise. You might say this man was saved on a deathbed repentance. Occasionally you might have somebody that is saved just before they die. I know a few that were, I believe. But uh, many of them, they 
just kind of reform, and then when they get well, they go back out into the same old life of sin. But this is the only man that I read about in the Bible was saved just before he left this world. We want to find out about him. Now this will be tape number 307. Is that tape number 307? I have some 300 tape listed. You want to write in and get a list? Well, I feel free to do so. I deal with many themes such as the second coming, the rapture, the tribulation period, the mark of the beast, the antichrist, hell, heaven, the Holy Spirit. And you can be benefited from these tapes. Now there may be some of you wondering what to give mother or dad or grandmother or granddad for a Christmas present. Let me ask you a question. Do they have a cassette tape recorder? If not, you can give them a better gift. They had a good tape recorder. They could get tape and listen to them. That would be a real blessing to them in days to come. Maybe many of a precious shut-in mother or grandmother or granddad right now. If they had a good tape recorder, they'd get some good sound gospel tapes, gospel preaching, and good singing, and then it would be a blessing to them. Think about that. And... Uh, if you think about these Bibles, if you're thinking about giving a Bible for Christmas. Now I'm in need of hearing from the radio listen audience. Now this ministry is a faith ministry. It's not a fly-by-night ministry. I've been on the air now in my 40th year daily from Athens, Georgia. I was preaching the gospel from the classic city of Athens, Georgia before many of you were ever born. And it's not a fly-by-night ministry, but I only stay on the air as God's people that God has spoken to financially. I can't pay the bills myself, not able to do it financially. I must have the help of God's people that love God that can see the need of this type ministry. There's ever been a time when the gospel needs to be preached, it's now. And I want you to pray for me and stand by this home mission work. I am in need of hearing from you, the listener. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, through the facilities of this station where you're now listening, the Big John Station here in Athens, Georgia. You can get the daily broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon. Now with that in mind, Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness of all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. All the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. Now that's reading from Luke chapter 23 verses 39 through 49. Speaking about the man that was saved just before he left this earth. I've had the experience of leading a few people to God just before they passed on. But very few people ever get saved in the last few minutes of their lives. Very few. Now this man did, the only sin in the Bible who was saved just before he died as far as we know. Now I want you to notice wherein these thieves were alike. Now there's two men, two thieves, hanging on crosses beside 
the Lord Jesus. He's on the middle cross and they're hanging on crosses on either side. They were alike in respect to depravity of heart. They were both depraved creatures. Depravity of their heart, of course, is manifested. And they both were alike in that respect. Secondly, they were alike in their knowledge of Christ. One knew just about as much about the a savior as the other that seen him they were hanging by his side uh, one probably didn't know any more than the other about the savior and of course uh, the, what they've seen probably been about the same and so they were alike in the knowledge of Christ number three they were alike in that they both were malefactors both of these men were criminals both of these men were men that robbed and murdered and led insurrection against the government they deserve to be put to death, no doubt about it. And then they were both alike in the condemnation. They were both condemned. They came into the world condemned, and now they've been condemned by the law of the land. Now these two were alike in these uh, four respects. Now I'll mention, but I want to mention several other things about one of them that really did business with God. Number one, he realized he was a condemned thief. Verse 40. Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Now this man here, that went on to be with God, going to a better land, he realized he was a condemned thief. He knew that. He didn't try to get out of that. You might go to the average prison today, and you'll find people there that committed murder and various other crimes. And most of them will deny out of it. Most of them will say they're many of them will say they're not guilty. Many of them say they didn't have a fair trial, and they'll try to uh, get around it and evade the issue. But this man here admitted that he was a thief. He said, "I'm a thief. I, I know I'm a thief. I stole. I robbed, and so forth." You know, I I I, I, don't, I don't like to see people steal things and uh, from other people, honest people. I have a disdain for thieves, people that will go out and break in the houses and steal from other people, people that work hard and try to earn what little they have. Then some low-down, dirty thief will break in and steal and rob. I have a disdain for those fellows. They need God Almighty. They're headed toward hell, but they want to steal what others have. Now, this man admitted he was a thief. He said, I'm a thief. And he said, does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Now we're all condemned. The Bible tells us in John chapter 10, verse 18, that Jesus came in the world not to condemn us. We're already condemned. He came to save us. Now they were condemned, no doubt about that. And one of them admitted he was a thief. He said, I'm a thief. I did wrong. I stole. I robbed. I'm a thief. And he admitted that. Secondly, he knew he deserved death and hell. Now this man is on the way of getting something that both of them needed. This man knew he deserved death and hell. I deserve to go there, no doubt he said. Verse 41, And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. Now this man was honest. He knew that he deserved death. He knew that he should be put to death on that Turbo cross, and he knew he deserved to go to hell. He knew that. Now, unless you can get a man to see his lost condition and see his need of a savior and realize he's going to hell, you're not going to get that man saved. Now you have a pretty big job today getting people lost. The average big shot church today in the average big town have very few saved people because they all think they're saved. And you'd have to get them lost before you could get them saved. And they're not going to hear the gospel to that extent. They're not going to admit their loss. They're not going to admit they deserve to go to hell. They're depending upon their own self-righteousness and their good deeds and their amelioration of slums and the things of that type to try to get them in. And they're lost, headed toward hell like any other sinner. Now, people guys got to realize that they're lost. You'll never get saved till you realize that. Old Dr. B.B. B. Caldwell, a man in heaven today, told me many times, he said, Son, you've got to get people lost or you'll never get them saved. 
He said many church members don't know they're lost. Get them lost and then get them saved. In other words, get them to see that they're lost. They don't believe it. They don't realize it. Got to get them to see they're lost. He told me about one time he went up north on Easter Sunday morning. And he was to bring a message on Easter Sunday morning. And all the good ladies came in with Easter bonnets, Easter dresses on. And all diked up for the Easter service. And he got up. He said, I'm going to preach today on hell and who's going there. He said, man, you never saw such a roughed up crowd. Some of them took their bonnets off and some of them uh, threw their little uh, pamphlets down and, and uh, said that was the most disturbed audience he'd ever seen. But said he preached on hell of fire and damnation while those people ought to be in hell if they're not saved. He said that crowd really got upset. Now they wanted to hear a little sermon on the resurrection and have the preacher tell them how pretty they looked that day in their Easter clothes and how wonderful they were. But he, he preached right the object and got them stirred up. And I think got some of them saved during the revival. That might sound like a little mean, but that's what the old man preached. That's what God laid on his heart. You got to get people lost or you'll never get them saved. Number three, he saw Christ as a perfect savior. Verse 41, this man have done nothing amiss. There hangs his thief here on one side and the other thief on the other side. And he said, now this man has never done anything wrong. This man on the middle cross, he's a good man. Never done any harm. Never mistreated anyone. Never committed sin. He realized Jesus had never done anything wrong. And that's true today. The Son of God has never done anything wrong. Now, only one of these fellows really saw that. Now, you got to see Jesus Christ as very God. See them, see him as the Savior, as a perfect Son of God, as Jehovah God, or you'll never make it to heaven. Number four, he saw Christ as the innocent dying for the guilty. Look at verse 41. And he was indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man's done nothing amiss. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. He saw Jesus, the innocent one, dying for the guilty. The Son of God hanging on the cross, dying for people that were guilty. The Son of God was not guilty. In fact, he was dying in the place of one named Barabbas. They had freed Barabbas because it was custom in that day that they could let a man go free and let somebody else die in his place. And uh, they uh, let... Barabbas go free and Jesus died in his place. And Barabbas no doubt stood afar off and thought, my, my, there's a man on a middle cross there dying in my place, in my stead. I should be hanging there. And that man, as far as we know, has never done anything wrong. He's uh, the very son of God. He's dying for me, dying in my place. And that's what Jesus did on Calvary when he died for you and when he died for me. And he saw Christ as the innocent dying for the guilty. Now one thief said, we indeed justly. Now we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man's done nothing amiss. He said, I deserve to be hanging here. And my buddy on the other side deserves to be hanging there. But the man on the middle cross, he doesn't deserve to be hanging there. Because he's never done anything wrong. Number five, he humbly begged to be remembered. Look at verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now this man humbled himself very much. He was very humble about it. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. A very humble type man. And he wanted to be remembered. He knew that Jesus had a kingdom. And he wanted to be remembered by Jesus when he came into that kingdom. He's very humble. And he had faith because he believed that Jesus was coming into a kingdom. Now he's going to set up his kingdom on the earth one day. A literal kingdom. When he comes back the second time to reign on the earth. Now this man had faith enough to believe Christ had a kingdom. And the Bible said he repented. He repented. He said in verse 40, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Here's a man repenting of his sins. He said, does not thou fear God? 
You know, the Bible said the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. What are you saying, Preach Edwards? When God's been so good to you and blessed you and maybe spared you through sickness or maybe through uh, an accident or some uh, ill health or something other, don't you think that which should draw you closer to God? If God spared you, you had a close call in life and uh, maybe you come near being uh, killed, don't you think that ought to draw you near God? It would be if you're right with God. But if you're not right with God, you won't appreciate it. You won't honor God. You won't do what you should do for God. You'll just uh, sit back and say, well, I'm glad it's no worse. And, and fail to really repent and honor God and get closer to God. And be more faithful to God and the cause of God. If I went out here and I had a terrible a period of illness and had a close call and God spared me. I'd be in the house of God as soon as I got able to be there. I'd be there the next Sunday if I could get there. I, I'd, I'd, I'd praise God. I'd thank God for it. I wouldn't sit around and whine and say, well, this shouldn't have happened to me. I'd be doing something for God. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And if you're right with God, it will. If you're rebellious against God, no telling where you're going to wind up. I know a couple in... I preached a sermon in Cherokee Avenue Baptist Church in Atlanta. And a man and woman there had lost a little son. And they rebelled against God. God had been good to them. And they so rebelled against God, they quit coming to church. And so I preached that week. And I preached on Job one night. And they happened to be there. And the wife came down in tears. And repented of the way they've acted about the death of that child. A husband turned pale in the face, got up and stomped out. I don't know whether they ever went back or not. Now the wife did the right thing. He did the wrong thing. Now when God is good to us, we need to look to God to help us. God knows what's best. And so this man here knew that Jesus was the Son of God. He knew that. The goodness of God ought to lead us all repentance. When God's good to us, we ought to appreciate and show our appreciation. A lot of people just don't do it. Don't love God enough. Their heart's not in tune. And sometimes they blame God for circumstances. You shouldn't do that. And not only that, the Bible said he prayed in verse 42. He prayed. He said, Jesus, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And he believed Jesus would hear the request. He believed that. And he prayed that he'd be remembered. And he believed that Jesus would hear that request. Number six, he believed in the resurrection and kingdom of Christ. Verse 42, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now he believed in the resurrection of Jesus. He knew the Son of God was going to die on that cross. He knew that. He knew Jesus had been nailed to that cross. He knew that. And he knew the Son of God was going to die. But he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He knew if Jesus died... He'd be raised from the dead. He believed that. The Bible says, If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Here is a man that believes strongly in the resurrection of Jesus Christ before the Son of God ever died. You must believe in the resurrection. You can't go to heaven denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He showed how near a sinner can come to hell and yet be saved. How close he can come to hell and how near he can come to go into hell and yet be saved. Here's a man on one side of Jesus in a matter of minutes. He's, he's going to die and go to hell if he's not saved. Now this man became very close to hell and yet escaped the fire and went into paradise. The other man was so very close to paradise, missed paradise and went to hell. That's the difference in the two hanging on the cross. Number seven, he was delivered that day from a hellfire to paradise. Verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now we see Christ manifest his mercy toward this man and God saving this man. And God said, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. He didn't say later on when I come the second time or in the resurrection. 
He said, this very day you're going to be with me in paradise. Now that verse of scripture gives these Russellites, they call themselves Jehovah's Witness, a lockjaw. They can't quite handle that. That gives the Seventh-day Adventists the lockjaw. They can't handle it. These cults can't handle that. Because they believe in soul sleeping. They believe when a person dies, they won't know anything to the resurrection. See, these cults are bad wrong. They don't know what the Bible teaches. They've been led astray by false teachers and false prophets. And so that gives them the lockjaw. They can't quite handle it. They try to explain it away. That's why the Russellites uh, translated their own Bible so it would fit their false doctrine and they wouldn't have to believe the true word of God. But hell will be hotter for them when they do die without God. That's terrible. Now he said for Christ, he wanted Christ to have mercy. Christ had mercy on him. Jesus did not upbraid him. Now Jesus didn't say to this man, Now listen here, you thief, you rascal, you, uh, you rose up in insurrection against the government. Uh, you uh, stole, you were a thief, you were a murderer. Now Jesus didn't turn and point his finger or look at him and say, you're so guilty of all these things. No, no. Jesus did not upbraid this man with very tender mercy. Jesus said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. That's none too bad but what God won't save if they really mean business. Now there's no such thing as soul sleeping. Now you remember that. You have some today that believe in soul sleeping, that when you die, you know nothing to the resurrection. I mentioned that a few moments ago. And then not only that, but this man here, this scripture gives the Camelites a lockjaw. See, the Camelites believe that you have to be emerged in water in order to be saved. And so does the Jesus only come. They believe that you have to be emerged in water in order to be saved. Now, if you believe you have to be baptized to be saved, you're way off in left field. You're a long way from the truth of God, and that gives them the lockjaw. They can't hardly handle this. Here's a man that went straight from the cross down into paradise. He wasn't baptized. He didn't join the church. He didn't take the Lord's Supper. While this man went straight on into paradise. No water baptism for him. Now, there'll be people in heaven that's never been baptized and to be people in hell that's been baptized more than one time now you must remember that water baptism has nothing to do with the matter of being saved it's an act of obedience after you're saved it's not intrinsic to salvation because you're saved by the shed blood of the lamb this man had no chance to join the church had no chance to be baptized no chance to do good works no chance to give his tithes and offerings but he went right on to paradise now, I've seen people saved on their deathbeds. Or that in their, or their, while they were sick, disabled, couldn't come back to church, couldn't be baptized, went on to be with the Lord. There's been many of a good soldier saved on the battlefront. God saved him in the thick of battle. And uh, when he went on to heaven when he died, he didn't have a chance to be baptized. Didn't have a chance to join the church or uh, receive uh, communion, uh, anything of that type. It went on. See, you're saved by the grace of God. It's not your do's and don't do's. It's by the grace of God. Now, this man here couldn't pull out his pocketbook and say, let me give an offering. He couldn't say, baptize me, preacher. He couldn't say, um, let me join the church. He couldn't say, let me have a part in the communion service. No, no. He was nailed to a cross and he was helpless. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And this man went that very day straight down into the heart of the earth. At that time, paradise was down in the heart of the earth. Paradise on one side called Abraham's bosom. Hell on the other side where Dives ended up. When Jesus died on the cross, he went down and carried this man with him to paradise. And then he carried all the inmates of paradise with him and carried them back to the third heaven. That's where paradise is today. Paradise has been moved out of the heart of the earth. Hell is still down there. The rich man is still down. This other thief is still down there. But the man that got saved, he's up there in paradise in the third heaven. You need to remember that now verse 39 tells you why this man here on the other side went to hell. You have a conjunction there that a big old lift. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed him said, If 
Thou be Christ. Save thyself and us. You've got to get rid of those ifs and ands and buts. You must believe that he is. That he is very good. You can't say if this and if that and but this and but that. You've got to believe what God said in this book. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. We need to realize that this man said, If, if you be the, the Christ, just come on down off of that cross and you can save yourself and you won't have to die. And you can save us and we won't have to die. That big old if, that conjunction, damned his soul in hell. Beloved, get rid of your ifs, your ands, your buts, and so forth. And believe in Jesus Christ with all of your heart and soul. Believe that he is. Believe he's the Savior. Believe he's very God. Don't say, if you be the Lord, if you be the, the Messiah, if you be the Savior, you might as well just shut up. Go on to hell because God's not going to save you as long as you've got a big if there in your mind. If you get saved, you got to come humble before God, believing that he is. Like the other thief said, Lord, you remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had no question mark in his mind. He knew he deserved to go to hell and did something about it. The unsaved thief, you know, he couldn't enter into the kingdom. He didn't go. You know why? The Bible said thieves don't go to hell. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Know you not? That the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuse themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. God said drunkards don't go to heaven. They can't go into the kingdom of God. They're going to hell. Nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible tells you that. The only way you can go to heaven, you got to get saved. If you're a drunken, if you're a thief, you're an adulterer, if you're a feminine, if you're a homosexual, or if you're a covetous, or you're a reviler, or a reveler, or whatnot, you got to get saved, you're going to hell. There's a certain as I'm speaking to you today. Now both were equal in your Christ. One is just about as close to Jesus on one side as the other. Equally close. One went to hell, one went to paradise. Both saw and heard all that happened around that cross. They had a good set of ears. They heard everything that was said, both of them. Equally heard what was said around the cross. Both were dying, suffering men. They had spikes in their hands, in their feet. There they were, suffering, dying, both of them. There they were, both of them. Both were wicked, ungodly sinners. Born in sin, lived a wicked, ungodly life. On the road to hell and without God. Both weak and sinners. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. To the one with the save of death and the death. The other the save of life and the life. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful sharp. than a two-edged sword. He shows how near a sinner can be to Christ. And die and go to hell. That sinner was so near Jesus. If he could have took his arm off and broke through and freed that hand, he could probably reach down and touch the Son of God. And yet he went to hell. So many people have been so close to being saved. And yet die and go to hell. How terrible. There they were, hanging one on one side and one on the other. And one of them got saved on what you call a deathbed repentance. That is, just before he died, he got saved. The other went on to hell the other went to paradise. Both of them there hanging beside Jesus. Both had an equal chance to do something about it. Only one did something about it. I have friends. I have loved ones today that I grew up with. I went to school with them. I played with them. We played together. We updated together as young men. And we uh, seemed like real brothers. And I've known them. Uh, very closely, very intimately, but some of them that I know that I grew up with, very close to me, died and went to hell. And here I stand preaching the gospel today. That's the difference. What made the difference? Brother Edwards, I got saved back yonder many years ago, and they didn't. They died and went to hell as far as I know. We were about the same age, went to school, played together, loved each other. They died and went to hell as far as I know. Some of them I preached at the funeral. 
I couldn't say this in heaven because they didn't get saved. God help us. We need to realize that those that repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Those that don't, you can have that big conjunction in your mind, go straight to hell as a martin to his gourd. You must come humble as a little child, believing in Jesus all your heart, knowing you can't save yourself, knowing that you should go to hell, but by God's grace and mercy, you don't have to go and trust Jesus as your Savior, and God will save your never-dying soul. One went to paradise, one went to hell. The one that went to paradise is now up there in paradise. The one that went to hell is still down there in hell where diabetes went. Where are you going when you die? That's left entirely up to you. And if you're not right, you ought to get right today. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll take the message and use it. God, back yonder is a wicked sinner. One day you saved me. You saved others here in this church. You saved others in the radio listening audience. Oh my God. I'm so glad, Father, you saved me. I have precious friends and loved ones that's gone on to hell. God, but you saved this wicked man, and I'm so glad. Oh God, there may be somebody here this morning needs to get saved. Somebody in the radio listening audience needs to get saved. I pray that you speak to hearts in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie play on stanza so far as if you're in this building and you're not saved, you ought to come to God. You ought to come and get saved. If you're backslidden on God, you ought to come back to God. If you need a church home, you ought to come and join Northside. Any other reason you need to come forward, you ought to come while we wait. Would you come? Let me tell you this before we go. Many years ago, the small lumberjacks always on the weekend and go into town and drink or rouse around on Sunday night they'd come back on the way back that Sunday night they passed by the little church a tabernacle was having a meeting they decided to go in there's three of them decided to go in and hear the preacher they went and sat in the back one of them got on a deep conviction and when they gave the invitation he said I'm going down to get saved the other said you're a fool you wait or we'll go with you next time he said no I better go now God speaking to me now. I need you to say now. They said, if you wait till next week, we'll go with you. They said, no, I need to go now. He went down and got saved. The other two walked out. The next day, he was a sawyer. And something happened and jerked him into that saw and cut him up.